Fury Polar Exploring Ship Roosevelt, frozen fast in the Arctic ice pack off Cape Sheridan, Grant Land, just about the northernmost reach of land in the Western Hemisphere. It is one hour before noon here, April 6, 1909, and we're going to make another attempt to establish radio contact with Commander Robert E. Peary. Commander Peary, Matt Henson, and their four Eskimo drivers were last heard from six days ago. The commander estimated his position then to be 130 miles south of 90 degrees north latitude. Unless unforeseen emergencies have arisen, the party should have covered that distance by now, and Commander Peary should be at or somewhere near his great goal, a goal no man has ever obtained before, the top of the earth, the North Pole. If all has gone according to plan, Peary has been traveling approximately 25 miles a day. His last recorded position was 87 degrees, 47 minutes north latitude. 866, 99. The polar exploring ship, Roosevelt. You are there. The men aboard the Roosevelt wait as Commander Robert E. Perry, Matthew Henson, and four Eskimos dash across the frozen Arctic Sea toward the unconquered North Pole. CBS takes you back 40 years to the climactic hour of a great scientific adventure. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you. Houston, directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on historical fact in quotations. A fact in quotations. A fact in quotations. Back in quotation. And now, the polar exploring ship Roosevelt and John Belt and John Belt and John Daly. And the Perry is speaking so valiantly, for over being so valiantly, for degrees, north latitude, the north east, north latitude. The north east ago, when we last talked to the commander, he told us that he would not broadcast again until he had either reached the pole or had been forced to turn back. He said he hoped he would be talking to us again on April the 6th at 11 a.m. from the pole. Well, it is April the 6th. It's 11 a.m., so let's try and make that contact. This is the Roosevelt calling Commander Peary. This is the Roosevelt calling Commander Robert E. Peary. Come in, Commander Peary. Come in, Commander Peary. This is the Roosevelt calling Commander Peary. Come in. It may be that Commander Peary is trying to get through to us, but atmospheric conditions are preventing his signal from reaching the Roosevelt, or he may still be traveling toward the pole or back from it. We just don't know. But we're going to keep on trying to make that contact. Our circuits will remain open. Here aboard the Roosevelt, the original members of Peary's Polar Party are packed into this little radio room, listening eagerly, waiting word from their commander, word that will tell them that the great project they embarked upon nine months ago has finally been successful. The original pull-up of seven Americans. Besides Commander Peary... There are Matt Henson, the commander's constant companion during all his previous polar expeditions, the skipper of the Roosevelt, Captain Bob Bartlett, young George Borup, fresh from Yale, Dr. J.W. Goodsell, our surgeon, Donald McMillan, schoolteacher from Worcester, Massachusetts, and Ross Marvin, a veteran polar explorer. Bartlett, Borup, and Marvin are not aboard the Roosevelt at this time, but McMillan and Dr. Goodsell are here, and Dr. Goodsell is at the microphone right now. Well, Dr. Goodsell, are you at all worried about the fact that we haven't heard from the commander? And not a bit. The commander's all right. He'll make the poll and he'll come back. Well, why are you so confident, Doctor? Well, anyone who's had the opportunity to work as closely with Peary as I have must have confidence in the man. The commander's an engineer. He has applied the scientific method to every phase of this expedition. Planning, planning, and more planning. From the very moment we started nine months ago in New York, the hand of Peary, the master engineer, was in evidence. Well, you've spent many months up here, sir, but only now are you really making the dash for the pole. Well, uh, Peary knew the pole could be achieved only during the very short season between the 1st of March, approximately through the middle of April. So he brought the Roosevelt up last summer, wintered here. 
spent the dark, weary hours of the Arctic night training the men for the job ahead, uh, toughening us up, teaching us how to build and how to use igloos, how to work the sled, uh, work with the Eskimos, how to live with the Arctic. Men who came up green and soft in August were hardened Arctic hunters and explorers by February. Well, I think you're a fine example of that, Doctor. Now, I am indeed. Uh, all the men are physically in better shape now than they've ever been. Why, a series planning has been so complete, so detailed, that he even has... Excuse me, excuse me, Dr. Goodfell. Something is coming through on our receiver. The signal is not very clear. It's Captain Bartlett's frequency, and it must be he. Go ahead, Captain Bob. Where are you, sir? Yes, Captain Bartlett, we hear you. Where are you, sir? Where are Have you heard from the commander? What's that? Uh, will you repeat that, please? Have you heard from Peary? What about the commander? Have you had any word from Peary? Uh, not yet, Captain Bartlett. Uh, not yet. But where are you, and how are you? Fully, fully. I'm at Camp 16, on my way back to the ship. Well, when did you see Commander Peary last? I say, when did you leave Commander Peary? Oh, six days ago. How was he? Ship fine. Oh. How is the weather where you are? Uh, it's too blasted good. Too good. The ice is breaking up. Lots of open water all around. Well, did you get any farther north than 8747? Yes. I took a little stroll up the avenue. I got to about 88 degrees north. Well, congratulations, Captain Bob. That's a, a great record. Not as great as Perry's going to be. The commander's probably hanging out his wash on the pole right now. Well, were you disappointed in having to turn back after you got so near the pole, Captain Bob? Did you know, for instance, that the commander intended to take Matt Henson with him on the final lap instead of you? Well, I was kind of disappointed. But that was part of the Peary plan. Henson's a good man. None better for Arctic work. He's as good a sled handler as any Eskimo, and better than most. He's always gone along with the commander. So it's right that he should be in on the finish. How are things aboard me ship? Oh, everything's fine here, Captain Bob. Thank God he'd better be. You, you tell that crew of mine that the brass better be shining in the woodwork sparkling when I hit the deck, or by all that's holy, I'll strip off their blubber and feed it to me dog. Okay. Uh, I'll tell him, Captain. Uh, I'm, I'm dog tired now, and Commander may be trying to get through to you, so I'll try it off. Uh, I'll see you all again in one of three places, heaven, hell, or the Roosevelt. Okay, good luck, Captain Bob. <clears throat> Our channel will remain open. If Commander Perry starts calling, we'll hear him. The Perry plan Captain Bartlett mentioned is probably the most important feature of this expedition and possibly the, the greatest innovation ever introduced into Arctic exploration. The Perry plan is a, a carefully worked out system of relays which has as its main objective the getting of the commander to a point as close to the pole as possible, as fresh as possible, and with adequate supplies and equipment. And here's how it works. With the first break of spring twilight on February 22nd last, the entire party left the ship and proceeded by dog sled to the takeoff point at Cape Columbia, 90 miles west and north of this point. Captain Bob Bartlett, with his sleds and Eskimos, was the first to hit the polar sea on the dash northward. He cut a trail through the tortured, jagged pressure ridges that are formed when the gigantic 2,000-mile ice pack is crushed against the shoreline by the winds and the currents. And as he, Captain Bob, pushed out, he set up a series of igloo camps. Peary and the others followed in his trail, Peary always in the rear, conserving his energy, keeping himself fit and rested. Approximately every five days, a division of the main party, led by one of the Americans, would peel off from the main body and return to the ship, taking with them the most exhausted dogs and the least dependable Eskimo. Well, thus you, you can get the picture of the party gradually thinning out as its spearhead approached the pole. And finally, six days ago, at Camp 22, only 130 miles south of the pole, Captain Bartlett and the last supporting party peeled off, and Peary 
Nat Henson, and four Eskimos began the last lap of this great adventure. Uh, in addition to Bartlett, Ross Marvin is still out there headed back for the ship. We haven't heard from him in quite a while. Another leader of a supporting party is young George Forrest. He returned to land a few days ago, but instead of coming directly to the ship, he went off to the east to put down caches of supplies just in case some of the supporting parties may be forced to cut over that way on their return trip. George Borup is only 21, a Yale graduate and a well-known athlete in his college days. He's affectionately called the kid by the men of the party, and he's ready now to report by short wave on how he's getting along so many miles away from old Eli. Come in, George Borup. This is the Roosevelt calling George Borup. Kablunak. What's the matter? Don't you know your Eskimo yet? Kablunak means white men. Oh, yes. Well, we're fine, George. But uh, how's the weather out where you are? Ah, no, Ray, Dolly, Swat, Suli, Suli. Well, that sounds like some more of that Eskimo. What does it mean? Ah, no, Ray, Dolly, Swat, Suli, Suli. If you want a literal translation from pure spit out Eskimo, it means it's going like all Holding up under it, George. My feet are frost bitten and blistered. It's a good thing I've only got two to worry about. Just think if I were a centipede. Gee whiz. Well, what are you doing for that frostbite? You better look after it. I, I'm being attended by a famous Eskimo specialist on frostbite. Ava Tingwa. Right now he's giving me his extra number one special treatment. And what's that? Well... George, by the way, have you any word from Marvin? No, I thought he'd be aboard ship by now. No, he's not here. And I understand that he left the main party only a day after you did. I thought you might have uh, caught up with him. No, no, I didn't. But, but don't worry about good old Marvin. He can take care of himself. Hey, listen, you fellas better start getting ready for me. Uh, I know what that is. Steak, biscuits, and coffee. You said it! So start piling it up. I'm going off now. It's too cold to do anything but rest and listen in for words from the commander. Words that spell B-I-C-T-O-R-Y. Okay, George Barrett. While we've been talking, our circuits have been open, of course, but nothing as yet has come through from Commander Fury. It's just possible that he may be waiting for us to call him in. So let's make another try at raising the commander at or near the pole. This is the Roosevelt calling Commander Peary. Come in, Peary. Come in, Commander Peary. Come in, Commander Peary. This is the Roosevelt calling Commander... Still no news, but of course we'll keep right on trying. The commander said that we would be hearing from him at approximately this hour, and every man aboard the Roosevelt is fully confident that he will get through to us and that uh, he'll have the news that we're all waiting for. The normal act come to a dead stop at this time. And as we said earlier, most of the men of the original party who came up here into the north are now crammed into this little radio shack listening intently to the speaker on the far wall, hoping that they will hear Commander Peary's voice. As a matter of fact, the only ones aboard ship who seem somehow to be immune to the tension and the drama of the hour are the Eskimos. For them, this is just another day. Some of the men are out on hunting trips. The women and the children with us are out on the deck as usual, enjoying the rather balmy weather we're having. 
a mere 27 degrees below zero. Ned Calmer, if he's not yet congealed, so for an icy report on life among the Eskimos, come in, Ned Calmer. Here on the foredeck of the Roosevelt are a community of Swiss Sound Eskimos. 29 men, women, and children have been keeping house for the last seven months. Most of us had preconceived ideas about Eskimos. All Eskimos, so said the book, are a crude, primitive people, lazy, immoral, not to be trusted. They lie, they cheat, and they're dirty. Well, at least one part of that's true. They are primitive people. They have no written language, no school, no government, no king, queens, or chiefs, no idea of what money is, no property. But seven months of living with these Eskimos, living as close as one has to live aboard this little ship that's no bigger than an ocean-going tug, seven months of close contact have shown us that these Smith Sound Eskimos are honest. They don't lie. They're loyal, intelligent, and in fact, wonderful companions. They're not lazy. The men are almost constantly out hunting. The women work 10 and 12 hours at a stretch. Incidentally, they've made every stitch of the clothing worn by the members of the polar party. And they're a gay, uh, happy people, always ready to laugh with you or at you, as the case may be. I think the story that they can't be trusted is exploded forever on the basis of their work with this expedition. These Eskimos love command. A member of the crew has just fighting two dog teams coming in at a very fast clip. They're about a quarter of a mile away as I make it, just rounding the towering Foberg out there and making directly for the ship. The dog... Straining at the traces, I can't quite make out who the men are, but most probably it's Ross Marvin and the two Eskimos could look to and Harrigan. Harrigan, of course, is a nickname. A member of the crew taught in the hit tune from George M. Cohan's musical comedy, 50 Miles from Boston, and the Eskimo keeps singing it all the time. He hasn't the faintest idea of what the words mean, but he keeps bawling it all day long. You know, H-A-R-R-I-G-A-N spells Harrigan. As the crew of the Roosevelt has come pouring out of the deck house, they're all at the rails now, waving, greeting the oncoming team. And Donald McLuhan has also come out. He's right here at the rail with me now. Mac is an old friend of Ross Marvin's, and I guess he's mighty glad to see him coming back, aren't you, Mac? There's something wrong. Wrong? I see only two men, the two Eskimo. I don't see Marvin. Oh, those huskies aren't whooping and hollering the way they usually are when they come back to ship. McLuhan is going over to the gang track that leads from the deck to the ice. He's going out towards the oncoming sleds, which have almost reached the ship's side now, and I'm going to follow him with this microphone. The hangway is pretty slippery. You have to watch the step going down. But look to, and Harrigan are bringing their dogs to a halt. Everybody's running up to them. McMillan, the Eskimos, the crew members surrounding them, shouting questions. And but look to, and Harrigan have come off the sledges. They've sunk down on their knees in the snow. They're crying. Where's Marvin? Wait a minute, Marvin. McMillan is questioning. Put the Harrigan, where's Marvin? There's been a dog about Kuliame, Dushan Angelog. No. Mac, what happened to Marvin? He barks for me. He petrix of Kutlea Pukut. Kutlea. Oh, my God. Mac, translate. What's he saying? Marvin's dead. Down. Down? Where? How did it happen? Kanuk. Kanuk. He was swamut. Kanuk lapuk. Algereput. Dagureput. Kuritakhisiani. Dagabal. Dagabal. Who's at the big lead? Ross evidently tried to cross on soft ice. He was out ahead of them, and when they got to the lead, all they saw was the back of his coat floating in the water. Kutlaput. Tom, you'd, you'd better get these two below deck. Let them eat and rest. We'll find out more when they're not too worked up. Come along. Gotta get something to eat. Go ahead, Harry. Go, go with it. I've, it's difficult to express what this means to all of us. Ross was... Ross Marvin was one of the real dynamos of the party. Tireless, experienced, Arctic explorer, a scientist to his fingertips, a gentleman, a wonderful comrade. The tragedy occurred at the big lead, a very wide stretch of open water, about 100 miles to the north, 
It was here that Fury and his men were held up for four long days on their dash toward the pole. But it did finally freeze over, and the party were able to get across. However, the new ice, as might be expected, was thin and treacherous. And on the way back, Marvin must have misjudged the thickness of the ice and decided it was safe to cross. These leads, these fissures in the polar sea, are the greatest hazards in all Arctic exploration. You never know. This Peary calling the Roosevelt. This is John Daly in the radio room of the Roosevelt. We've interrupted that drama because Commander Peary is calling in. This is Peary calling the Roosevelt. Yes, yes, Hello. Commander Peary. Yes, we can hear you. This is the Roosevelt. We hear you, Commander Peary. Yes. Hello. Are you at Hello. the pole, Commander? Are you at the pole? I, I don't know. We have just set up our camp. I am going to take my observations now. Well, do you, do you think you've made it, Commander? Do you think you've reached the pole? I can't say, but we will know. As soon as I have computed my position. Well, how is Matt? How are the others? Uh, uh, fine. Here is Matt now. Hello. Hello, Roosevelt. Hello, Matt. How do you feel? It is a fiddle. Well, what do you think, Matt? Are you at the pole? My dead reckoning. I say with average close to 25 miles a day since Captain Bob left it, that should put us close. What's the commander doing now, Matt? He's shooting the sun down behind a little snow windbreak we built. Flat on his stomach. How does he look? He's very thin, very tired. I don't think he's slept for one hour during this past week. Well, is he excited? It's hard to tell about the commander. He never shows his feelings. Well, how about you? What are you thinking about, Matt? Ninety degrees. 
Robert Louis Cheon. We were very interested in finding out what the Peary family would think of our recreation of the Admiral's moment of triumph. So we asked Admiral Peary's daughter, Marie Anaguito, to come here and tell us. Marie Anaguito was born in Greenland. She was once known as the famous Snow Baby. Today she is Mrs. Edward Stafford of Washington, D.C., the president of the Society of Woman Geographers. Mrs. Stafford, what did you think of our broadcast? Why, I'm so excited, I'm practically breathless. I feel as if I'd actually been on board the Roosevelt. But I have been tremendously impressed with the amount of research and the meticulous attention to accuracy that has gone into this broadcast. Of course, it was a little difficult on my part to adjust to the use of radio in my father's work because Mother and I have always congratulated ourselves that during all the 20 years of Dad's expedition, radio wasn't in existence. Well, that's not very complimentary to radio. Oh, well, Mr. Shea, don't misunderstand me, please. I'm speaking only from the family point of view. Uh, when Dad came back and told us of his many narrow escapes, uh, we could hardly listen to him, even when his presence proved that the story had a happy ending. And just think how ghastly it would have been if we had had radio to bring us a day-to-day -day account of the risks and hazards that were the usual routine of Dad's expedition. From his point of view, of course, I can see that radio would have been wonderful in helping to direct his parties in the field. You probably know, Mrs. Stafford, that many people think your father's expedition had no real significance. Well, the fact remains that no man has done what my father did, walk to the pole on his own two feet. And uh, Dad certainly proved that man's endurance and his ingen ingenuity and his courage can overcome the forces of nature, even if they're harshest. And that, Mrs. Stafford, is the theme of today's broadcast. That's precisely why we did it. And I'm certainly glad you did. And I feel very sure that those members of my father's polar party who are still living, Commander McMillan, Dr. Goodsell, Matt Henson, and, of course, Utah, Dad's faithful Eskimo companion, would want to join Mother and me in thanking CBS for recreating so accurately and so very dramatically this great American achievement. Thank you very much for being with us, Mrs. Stafford. Perry's Dash to the North Pole was another broadcast in the series You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon. Perry's Dash to the North Pole was written by Irv Tunick. Admiral Perry was played by Eric Dressler, Matthew Henson by Canada Lee. The cast included Matt Crowley, Scott Scottsworth, Cliff Carpenter, Joseph Conway, John Merlin, Guy Sorrell, and others. Next week, March 7th, 1815, France. Napoleon returns from Elba. You are there. The First Lady of the American Theater, Ms. Helen Hayes, will repeat her famous broadcast, My Little Boy, tonight on the Electric Theater. Betty Davis will be heard on the Family Hour. Barbara Stanwyck will be Jack Benny's special guest. And Eve Arden will be heard again on Our Miss Brooks. Listen to them all on CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>